Um, I haven't done a presentation for a long time, and it really, I'm very enheartened by, by you showing up, so thank you. So what is viewpoint diversity? Diversity is a word that we hear a lot these days, and rightly so, but not so much viewpoint diversity. So um, I want to do a little exercise. So when I say the words viewpoint diversity, what do you feel? Just yell out one or two words. Viewpoint, say? Say? Expansive. Understanding. Cultural differences. Oh. <laughs> Challenge. Yeah. Individual. Opinion. Openness. Nice. It brings up all kinds of uh, feelings in people because sometimes they feel threatened by that idea. But we're going to talk more about that. What is viewpoint diversity? It is. Um, diverse perspectives, of course, but I do want to point out that true inclusion actually requires viewpoint diversity, not just the viewpoints of the people that you are like-minded with, right? So, so often the word inclusion right now is used to only include certain people and not others. There's an exclusion with it. Um, viewpoint diversity is useful in any context family, work, uh, relationships, organization, getting stuff done together. So although um, I won't always bring that back, I, will, I do want you to keep it in mind this is, in, is not just about politics. And for me, I can truly say that in my five, six years doing this, it has led to my personal enrichment, better relationships, and building bridges. So I have a, a personal example about viewpoint diversity, and that is with my um, then-husband, Tom, who was really, really good at like moral and ethical um, figuring things out. And I would go to him often with problems, uh, and I'd say, look, there's X happening. I could do A, B, and C. And so often he would say, well, what about D and E, which were things I never thought about. That's viewpoint diversity. Now, if I was having trouble in my couple and saying, la, 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 whatever you say, I'm not hearing, I wouldn't be able to take it in, right? But most of the time, I mean, I've got chills right now because it never occurred to me D&E, &E, and most of the time, his was a better solution. So that's a really practical way viewpoint diversity can work in our personal lives. Um, I came up with this um, definition. Viewpoint diversity allows me to comprehend other points of view in such a way that it informs and impacts the way I see and understand the whole issue or situation. So part of the thing is not necessarily, I mean, ultimately you draw conclusions, but there's something about just understanding what's going on. We have to zoom out really far, and if we have any biases and any filters that are getting in the way, we're not going to see the whole picture. Um, Viewpoint diversity allows me to zoom out and get the biggest view I can so that I can make the best decisions based on a more thorough understanding and examination. So most of the time, I believe I'm perceiving the word, world accurately through my personal experience and the information, accurate or not, to which I expose myself. Peer groups, social media, media, politics, uh, politicians, and all of that is not only uh, narrow, but it's often very limited. So given that there's not one of us who can understand everything about anything, I need viewpoint diversity. I've been learning to question my own beliefs and then be able to zoom out. That's my, one of my favorite words now, even though zoom is like a questionable word, um, to really zoom out to get the biggest picture and understanding that I can. And I try to get beyond my personal filters to find out as much as I can about what's going on. I want to show this, um, this little clip. It's two or three minutes. Monica Guzman is, uh, works for a, a national organization called Braver Angels, which is the best bridging organization in the country. They've been working about six years. They're well-founded, well-resourced. And uh, she's written a book called I Never Thought About It This Way, all about polarization. It's excellent. 
When it comes to disagreement about facts, or rather anything that we feel is just irrefutable, we get stuck. We don't know where to go to from there. Uh, what happens next is often rage, uh, shouting, insistence, you know, how could you, especially if you have a relationship, how could my own mother think, right? It's the expectations in our family relationships that make this so tough. The expectations we have of each other beyond strangers. But the conversation about what is true is not the only conversation we can be having. Maybe the most important question is a question you ask yourself, especially when you are tempted by making a judgment of the other person that leads you to a certainty that there's nothing more you have to learn. And that question is, what am I missing? What am I missing? That question is probably the most important question to ask in dangerously divided times. You will be tempted to think you're missing nothing. And that question has an assumption embedded in it. And the assumption is that, yes, you are missing something. There's something in this other person's concerns. There's something in how they arrived at their perspective that you don't have to agree with, but could make more sense and could illuminate the path to better understanding and hopefully to something that is better than the brokenness and the blindness. It could help us see and build a world that sees itself. So some of you might know this fable about the blind man and the elephant. Um, they were asked to describe an elephant, and of course they could only grab the piece of the elephant that they were near. And in this illustration, it's a snake, it's a wall, it's a rope. Um, we need others to show us our blind spots. We all have blind spots. That's not, it's not a glitch. We only can perceive so much, and we have our filters and lenses, etc. We're all the blind men, the blind people, and the person from the other side or another side might just know something I don't, right? Like she's saying, and I think there's a few things I'm gonna highlight that I, I, I'm hoping that will be takeaways for you. And one is the, the self-inquiry of like, what am I missing here? Okay, so why do we need viewpoint diversity? And this is a partial list. Uh, lack of viewpoint diversity limits us in our understanding at whatever matters and at is, ha is at hand, you know, be it political or personal on the workplace. So first of all, viewpoint diversity makes us better informed and it allows us to zoom out, which allows us to comprehend the bigger picture, which allows us to understand people and their positions, which allows us to make more informed and therefore better sustainable decisions together. Because starting from viewpoint diversity, what's the, what's the goal? We want to get stuff done. This has been a constant gridlock, right? More and more, we're just, nothing's getting done on either, anybody's agenda. So um, another way that we need viewpoint diversity is to collaborate. So viewpoint diversity allows us to move beyond gridlock. I don't have to mention how many examples there are in pol politics and policy. And um, interestingly enough, this morning, I read a very good article. If anybody wants it, just give me a heads up or write it down on the sign-up sheet and I'll send it to you. Um, it's a, a new concept called adversarial collaboration. And I really love that. And um, do you guys know Jonathan Haidt? Some of you do. Anyway, I, I, I'll mention him later on too. But he, he talks about that we're wired to be lawyers. We, I, we're, we're wired to debate our side and try to win, not to find the truth, or cl as close as we can get to the truth, right? But with what they were talking about in this article about adversarial collaboration is to come in with good faith. Good faith that the other person might enlighten us about something that I'm missing. And then we can make really good educated decisions together, right? Best we can. Um, so now I want to show a, a little short, I think it's three or four minutes. So this is by the Heterodox Academy, which was started in around 2017. John Haidt started it along with Steven Pinker and some really good thinkers um, out of Harvard. And um, I think it's out of Harvard. Anyway, this clip is about viewpoint diversity on campus for which these thinkers were very uh, concerned that there were not enough conservative voices, that they were being not allowed to speak, and things like that, which have turned out to be true. Um, 
but I think whatever, uh, even though they refer to campus, it, it applies to what we're talking about. What is reason? Philosophers have long told us that it's humanity's highest and noblest attribute. It's what separates us from other animals. It's what allows us to separate truth from falsehood. There's just one problem. When psychologists study real people trying to reason, what they find is that reason is a gigantic, crippling flaw. It's called the confirmation bias. People don't use their reasoning abilities to find the truth. They use reason to confirm the views that they already hold. Now put people into teams where everyone holds the same beliefs, and the confirmation bias grows into a collective mania. Everyone helps everyone else find reasons why their side is right, further deepening shared bonds. Heaven help any individual who thinks for herself, or who looks for evidence on the other side. Such people are called traitors, and groups have many ways of shutting them up. When everyone's beliefs line up, and when dissenters are punished, that's the definition of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy can be great if you're heading into battle and you want everyone marching in lockstep. But what if your goal is truth rather than victory? What if you actually wanted to help students overcome their confirmation bias and learn about the perspectives of others? What if you wanted to create a community of researchers who could actually study and solve social problems? In other words, what if you wanted to create a university? Would you want orthodoxy? Or would you want its opposite, heterodoxy, where multiple views are not just permitted, but encouraged? In a heterodox university, each person can still use their reasoning powers to find reasons why they are right and others are wrong. But here's the brilliant thing. Each person becomes the solution to someone else's confirmation bias. This is why universities must have viewpoint diversity. Viewpoint diversity is the only reliable way to get around confirmation bias. Viewpoint diversity is the secret to a great education. It may not always be comfortable, but when ideas collide, we learn, we grow, together. Everyone gets smarter. The alternative? Campuses that try to protect students from unapproved ideas, books, and speakers. A politically orthodox university discourages dissent, creativity, empathy, and truthfulness. That's why more than a thousand academics from across the political spectrum have joined Heterodox Academy. Working with students, professors, and administrators, Heterodox Academy is rebuilding the culture of free inquiry and open, civil debate that turns universities into engines of discovery, growth, and progress. Support free inquiry. Share your voice. Stand up for viewpoint diversity. Visit heterodoxacademy.org. So I'll repeat, it bears repeating, viewpoint diversity is the only reliable way to counter our confirmation bias, which is the predisposition to search for, interpret, and confirm your pre-existing beliefs. So I, I wanna put it another way too, it's confirmation bias is when we embrace the information that validates our beliefs, sometimes highly cherished beliefs, and dis is when we reject those things that challenge our beliefs. That's another wonderful takeaway to start seeing in yourself if that's what you're doing. Like, we'll get more into that in a moment. Um, why else we need viewpoint diversity? We need to update our opinions. And I say that because when I started this work in 2017, I took a deep dive into educating myself about lots of things, but different viewpoints on issues especially. And um, what I found out, a lot of my opinions I had formed decades ago, 20, 30 years ago, I'd never gotten the upgrade, right? So viewpoint diversity allows us to hear what we didn't know, what we didn't know about, what's new. There's new information coming out all the time, either in our own personal inboxes, metaphorically, or what discoveries are made. Um, with studies and things like that, new information all the time, and there's always incompleteness in our knowledge, even experts, right? So if we put our heads together, we have a better chance of, of understanding things. Um, there's, a, a, oops. there's a man named Malcolm Gladwell, who's a contemporary author, some of you know him, 
And he says, I feel I change my mind all the time. And I sort of feel that's your responsibility as a person, as a human being, to constantly be updating your positions on as many things as possible. And if you don't contradict yourself on a regular basis, then you are not thinking. I mean, intuitively it makes sense, but it's hard with our nervous systems. So those are some of the reasons we need viewpoint diversity. Um, now I want to talk about what gets in the way. What are our obstacles to taking in viewpoint diversity? So um, who here has never been wrong? Raise your hand. <laughs> Usually there's some wise acre who raises his or her hand. Um, well, then why is it so hard to admit it? Why is it so hard to admit we're wrong? So there's, we could do a week-long you know, uh, workshop on this. But one obstacle is a lack of humility. Why do we lack humility? Why do we need to be right? So being wrong can make me feel stupid, ashamed, inadequate, incompetent, which is I'm getting over it, but that's like the worst thing I like feeling is mm -hmm. incompetent. But worse than all that, and so I'm speaking from my personal experience, it can make me feel wobbly. And this kind of sense like, and this is how I was in 2017, 2018, if I'm wrong about this, what if I'm wrong about everything I ever believed? And I really, we'll talk more about the nervous system, but my nervous system got so whacked out mm -hmm. I would get in a hot bathtub some days three and four times mm -hmm. just to calm down because I wanted to grow, I wanted to learn, I wanted to be in my discomfort zone. I knew there was this good stuff on the other side, but it's hard, I won't kid you. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that happened for me, and before I did this work in 2017, I, I taught and gave classes, so from 2010 on, I was really more in the public eye and did a lot of public speaking, which I'd never done before. And I was very anxious because I was scared that somebody was gonna challenge me or catch me in something I was wrong about. Um, so, and, and I remembered sometimes, I was teaching at SOU sometimes, and somebody would say something, and I swear, I would just go deer in the headlights. I get the freeze response. Mm -hmm. and, but what I learned to do, slowly but very surely, is to turn that humiliation and that fear of humiliation into humility. And it's a beautiful place. Like, if someone had told me, if I had known at the beginning of, of my journey in 2017 how hard it would have been, I would have said no. And I am so glad, I am so glad the personal part of it, the personal enrichment and the freedom is amazing. There's a little infomercial there. Um, so, or, or in other words, the Harry Met Sally moment, like I want what she's having. <laughs> so, um, so feeling right, so that's not necessarily being right, right? There's a difference. Um, it can give us false senses of security, of being okay, of being certain, of self-righteousness, even of being strong and powerful. But I really want to highlight the word false sense of, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's often girding up something frightened in us to take these positions of being right. Our nervous systems like certainty, even if we're wrong. There's a movie, um, it's just a feature film, it's, it's uh, wonderful movie called Dean Spanley. Has anybody, it's a New Zealand film. It's really great about grief actually as it turns out. But there was a quote in there, only the closed mind is certain. So I just want you to take that in a minute. Only the closed mind is certain. So if we want to grow in this way, if we want to do this kind of self work, it's really important to grow and stretch our tolerance for the discomfort of uncertainty and not knowing, and to be able to self-regulate our nervous systems before you get to the other side of it, like me with the hot baths. Um, some people say that the discomfort zone is the growth zone or can be the growth zone. Some of us know it through having gone through psychotherapy where 
a lot of times there were breakthroughs or insights or ahas after a period of seeing something about ourselves maybe we weren't thr so thrilled about, so could make us anxious. Even change will make us anxious, even if we want the change. Another way that there's a discomfort zone is when we're working out, we're going to the gym, we're trying to get stronger or more supple or whatever we're trying to do, there's usually some discomfort, right? We ache and we don't want to do it and there's some struggle maybe. But in this case, there's another muscle that we are building and it's inner muscle. It's like an inner core strength that I can be uncertain, I could be wrong, I could say something tonight and one of you could say, well, that's, that's not right, it's this. And the old me would have gone deer in the headlights and the new me would go, what? Because it's something I maybe need to learn, right? It's something I don't know. I want to get better at what I do. I want to know what, what I'm missing. Um, so this discomfort is often moving from the familiar to the new and unfamiliar or the unknown. And our nervous systems tend to like the familiar and we're not so keen on the new. I also know that there are certain people who are predispo predisposed to really go for the new. So I, I don't want to say every, every one of us is like this. But in general, we have trouble with change. The other um, way, the other problem with humility is that it can be a defense against shame. And that is a day-long uh, workshop right there. We can start with childhood mortification at home with our parents, our siblings, school, summer camps. Um, where all these things can make us feel ashamed of who we are or what we do or afraid of speaking up or whatever. And in the course of these last five years, I ran across this quote from St. Augustine who said, reportedly, I, there, I err, therefore I'm human. So part of the work on our, about our own shame is to normalize errors of being wrong. There's no shame in it. We, as we saw at the beginning when no one raised our hand, there's nobody in this room who's never been wrong. And you know, the, the thing that I was able to do from being so easily humiliated is like laugh at myself more in a real way, not in a compensatory way, but really like, oh, these human foibles. Really, um, and that really, really helps. And you know, this whole thing about um, cultivating humility, it really is, it leads to a deeper acceptance of ourselves, but also of others. It's a lot more forgiving way to be. So we need to cultivate humility hmm. <clears throat> to take in new information, to open or change our minds, to take in other perspectives, and to actually be able to weigh their validity. Um, to, so we need it to really take in viewpoint diversity. There's a, um, this guy's a contemporary historian. Someone asked him, uh, is there any hope for humanity? And he said, humankind can rise to the occasion if we keep our fears under control and be a bit more humble about our views. And I, I've done, Two, well, I've done two almost year-long classes and another three-month class. And all the people who were in those classes pretty much said there were two things they came away with. One was they were more comfortable not knowing and they were less triggered. So keep their fears under control. And I thought, if those are the only two things I do even a little bit, uh, I'm good. I can die happy. So um, there's a lot to this material. It's a, a really so deeply satisfying and so, um, I don't know, free, freeing too. Okay, where am I? So the next set of dynamics I'm going to talk about are all things that are pre-wired. So what I mean by that, they're automatic, they're unconscious, they're, they're set up as a part of our um, survival instincts. So they all need a manual override. And what I mean by that is they, once we're aware of these dynamics, we can cut, catch ourselves in the act, we can take a pause, and maybe make a different choice about how we're res responding. So one of the, um, the dynamics is that we're wired for survival, okay? These are, these are wired. We're animals, you know, we're animals still. And um, we're wired to look for danger 
and to find safety and to self-protect. It's innate. And even, um, my mind just went blank, sorry. So even if this is maladaptive, um, so for instance, social scientists will talk about, uh, you know, we're not on the savanna anymore being chased by a mammoth, you know, or something like that. And yet, um, they've shown with brain scans that when people are confronted with opposite viewpoints, they can, their brains can light up as if it's the fight or flight response. So it's a phys physiological, and I don't know, I mean, I know in the past when I've been triggered about certain things, it does feel life and death. And, but part of the problem is when we're triggered, we can't think. We don't have connection with the thinking part of our mind. So, um, so that means these, these physiological fight or flight, we recognize them as being triggered, defensive, or reactive. And Chris Mooney, who's a scientific uh, journalist, he says we apply fight or flight reflexes not only to predators, but to data itself. So imagine you're reading a, a data about something that really contradicts something you strongly believe in, uh, not only intellectually believe in, but perhaps morally. And um, fight or flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really want to point out and really underscore here, by choosing to do any kind of this self-work, I'll call it, we are overriding our own biology, and that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal. I don't say this stuff lightly, and I encourage people to do it. It's worth it. Um, another part of um, survival instincts is what's called us versus them, or tribalism, group affiliation, or in-group, in out-group dynamics. And um, I want to show a clip now. It's a little longer. It's five or six minutes by Robert Sapolsky. Anybody know Robert Sapolsky? He's a neuroscientist. He's written some uh, books uh, uh, suitable for lay people. And um, he explains uh, this us versus them business. So when you look at us, us as humans, as apes, as primates, as mammals, when you look at some of the most appalling realms of our behavior, much of it has to do with the fact that social organisms are really, really hardwired to make a basic dichotomy about the social world, which is those organisms who count as us's and those who count as them's. And this is virtually universal among humans, and this is virtually universal among all sorts of social primates that have aspects of social structures built around separate social groupings. Uses and thems, we turn the world into uses and thems, and we don't like the thems very much and are often really awful to them. And the uses, we exaggerate how wonderful and how generous and how affiliative and how just like siblings they are to us. We divide the world into us and them. And one of the greatest ways of seeing just biologically how real this fault line is, is there's this hormone, oxytocin. Oxytocin is officially the coolest, grooviest hormone on earth because what everybody knows is it enhances mother-infant bonding and it enhances pair bonding in couples and it makes you more trusting and empathic and emotionally expressive and better at reason reading expressions and more charitable. And it's obvious that if you just like spritzed oxytocin up everyone's noses on this planet, it would be the garden eating the next day. Oxytocin promotes pro-social behavior until people look closely. And it turns out oxytocin does all those wondrous things only for people who you think of as an us, yeah. as an in-group member. It improves in-group favoritism, in-group parochialism. What does it do to individuals who you consider a them? It makes you crappier to them, more preemptively aggressive, less cooperative in an economic game. What oxytocin does is enhance this us-them divide. So that, along with other findings, classic lines of us versus them, along lines of race, of sex, of age, of socioeconomic class, your brain processes 
these us them differences on the scale of milliseconds, a twentieth of a second, your brain is already responding differently to an us versus them. <clears throat> okay, so collectively, this is depressing as hell. Oh my God, we are hardwired to inevitably be awful to thems and thems along all sorts of disturbing lines of, oh, if only we could overcome these us and them dichotomies that we're with. Oh no, are we hardwired to divide the world along lines of race and ethnicity and nationality and all those disturbing things. And what becomes clear is when you look closely is it is virtually inevitable that we divide the world of doses and thems and don't like thems very much and don't treat them well, but we are incredibly easily manipulated as to who counts as an us and who counts as a them. And those fault lines that we view as, oh my God, how ancient can you get that, say, somebody of another race evokes limbic responses in us, commensurate with, they are a them, they respond, they motivate automatic responses. Oh my God, is that just a basic fault line? And then you do something like have faces of the same race versus other race. And either they are or aren't wearing a baseball cap with your favorite team's logo on it, and you completely redefine who's an us. Us is people who like the Yankees, and them are Red Sox fans. And suddenly, you're processing within milliseconds what damn baseball cap they have and races being <clears throat> completely ignored. Oh my god, we are inevitably hardwired to make really distressing us that we're manipulated within seconds as to who counts as an us as a them. Good news with that, we can manipulate us out of some of our worst us-them dichotomies and recategorize people. Bad news, we could be manipulated by all sorts of ideologues out there as to deciding that people who seem just like us really aren't, and they're really so different that they count as a them. Okay, so fabulous study showing this, this double-edged quality to oxytocin, and this was a study done by a group in the Netherlands, and what they did was they took Dutch university student volunteers, and they gave them classic philosophy problem, the runaway trolley problem, is it okay to sacrifice one person to save five? Runaway trolley, can you push this big beefy guy onto the track who gets squashed by the trolley, but that slows it down, so that five people tied to the track down? standard problem in philosophy, utilitarianism, ends justifies means, all of that. So you give people this scenario and people have varying opinions, and now you give them the scenario where the person you push onto the track has a name. Uh -huh. And either it's a standard name from Netherlands, Dirk, I think, who's like a Pieter or something, which like, if you're, this is like a, a like a meat and potatoes Netherlandish name, or a name from either of two groups that evoke lots of xenophobic hostility among people from the Netherlands. Someone with a typically German name, oh yeah, World War II, that's right, that was a problem, or someone with a typically Muslim name. So now they're choosing whether to save five by pushing Dirk onto the track, or Otto, or Mahmoud, and in general, give them those names, and there's no difference in how people would rate it than if they were anonymous. Give people oxytocin, where they don't know that they've gotten it. Control group has just placebo spritz up their nose. Give people oxytocin, and kumbaya, you are far less likely to push Dirk onto the track, and Dirk is right. And you are now far more likely to push good old Otto or good old Mahmoud under the rails there, and you are more likely to sacrifice an out group member to save five, and you are less likely to sacrifice an in group member. All you've done there is exaggerate the us-them divide with that. Right. Um, lots of food for thought. Um, and remember how easily manipulated we are. Um, and look at what's happening with the media, with social media, with uh, like-minded people even, and politics. All of that stuff is really ramping this up. And many people in the bridging movement, which there is a robust bridging movement in the US, but usually you don't know about it unless you're looking for it. But most people, or many people in, in that uh, field, believes that this tribal us and them affiliation is the, most, uh, the strongest driver about the hyperpolarization. It's a very, very strong instinct. And, um, 
also, another thing he doesn't cover here, but in terms of survival, not belonging to the group means banishment, means death. It's, it's wired, even though we don't think maybe that's happening. And I want to give a personal example. So there was a period of time where uh, doing this bridging work, um, and I was deviating from some of the ideas on my side, right? And wasn't always met well. But I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night with kind of a panic attack. I'm going to lose the house. I'm going to lose the house. And really, I, could, I, I was panicked, so I wasn't able to think. The next morning, I thought, now that's ridiculous because my, my finances have nothing to do. I don't have a business here. I don't have a job I can get fired from. I can't be canceled in, in a way that would affect me financially because cancellation does happen. happen and people get fired for things like this. And um, the, all, also the idea of being ostracized for the people I considered my tribe. It was a, just like an animal panic. That's all I can say. So this idea that it might be running any of us more than we think it does is something worth pondering. Um, similar to this, um, and what also gets in the way of embracing viewpoint diversity, are issues of identity. So to the extent we're identified with our us, right? First of all, it creates a sense of belonging and bonding and safety, right? Safety in the group. It provides a familiar sense of self and of the world. And it also, you know, this idea of um, this identity that we belong to a group and this group understands the way the world works. This is part of that wobbliness when you start questioning or thinking about things in a different way. Things can get very, very wobbly. And um, it really is challenging to change. There's a writer, a uh, current writer named Adam Grant. He wrote a book called Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. Anybody? Excellent book, very accessible and very smart, which are really good qualities for me. So he has two quotes I want to share. One is, the hallmark of an open mind is not letting your ideas become your identity. Once, if I identify as X, and that's my reason for being and who I relate and I am a such and such, it's going to really be hard to extricate myself. So if you define yourselves by your opinions, questioning them feels like a threat to your integrity. If you see yourself as a curious person or a lifelong learner, changing your mind is a moment of growth, which kind of reminds me of the Gladwell quote again. And then he goes on to say, any time we're part of any group that has strong beliefs, it's pretty unlikely that we are going to rethink any opinions or decisions. Would you say that again? Yes. Any time we're part of any group that has strong beliefs, it's pretty unlikely that we're going to rethink any opinions or decisions. It's a very strong bond. Um, and then remember how he said ox uh, that oxytocin makes you crappier to the thems. And we often then, what, dehumanize them. And Brene Brown, who I bet a lot of you know, she wrote a great book called Braving the Wilderness a few years ago, which is actually all about bridging, as it turns out. And she has a whole uh, section on learning to go from dehumanizing to re rehumanizing. And that's part of all of this, how to stop dehumanizing the other side. So, but I also want to say we are wired for cooperation also, but we can't talk about cooperation if we think the other side has nothing of value to bring to the table. Maybe we're dehumanizing them and maybe we even perceive them as an existential threat. There was a study a few years ago, I don't assume that these figures have gotten any better, but they, people were asked whether um, the world would be a better place if the other political side was dead, just died, quote unquote. And I think it was 20% of Democrats and 15% of Republicans said yes. That's powerful hatred, wishing somebody was dead. 
Um, but I want to tell you about these two studies that were done somewhere between 2017 and 2019 by a group called More in Common. The first study was called the Hidden Tribe Study, and they found, they, they made a, you can look on their website, but they found that 15% of both sides combined, the extremities on both sides, really were the ones running the hyperpolarization, not the majority of the country. So 85%, uh, they called the exhausted majority. <laughs> but I, I want to give you a news flash. So there's a bridging organization called Bridge USA that works on bridging in campuses, on campuses. And they have renamed it the hopeful majority. So I really like that. I just read about that a couple days ago. Then uh, More in Common did a second uh, study. And you can go online and take this quiz. It's very short to see where you are on this. And they called it the perception gap. And what they found out is the majority of people think the other side is more extreme in their views than they actually are. So why are these two studies so important? So first of all, we're less polarized than we're led to believe in terms of numbers or percentages. Um, and the majority of people aren't extreme in their beliefs. That's the other thing. And this is my third thing. And, and there's a book I want to really tout. They probably have it here. Catherine Schultz, um, Being Wrong. It's a brilliant book. I used it as a textbook in, my, in an SOU class, Exploring Right and Wrong Through Film. Um, she talks about when we take strong moral stances, and sometimes they, those won't move. There are sacred cows, right? Strong moral stances based on bias, inaccurate information, or in this case, I find out you're an ex, one of the political parties, and I've already got my, <laughs> I've decided everything about you. And then I don't listen to you. And yet, if I dig a little deeper, if I do a little homework, if I educate myself a little bit, there's all kinds of people on the right and the left and anywhere else, independents. They're not all, in fact, most of them are not by the ideological line. There's some, like, some people like myself. I lean more conservative on some things. I lean more left on some things. But it shows me that I'm not, what I did before is just checked, checked the boxes on my side. I didn't research anything. I didn't learn. So, um, so that really gets me, actually, this, this idea that so many of us are taking these positions that are very strong, they're immovable, and they're based on wrong information, misperceptions. So now we're going to go on to this slide. Um, the other thing that gets in the way, big way of viewpoint diversity, is how our minds play tricks on us. Now, I don't expect you to read all this. I wanted to kind of just give you the impact of it, that social scientists have come up with 188 cognitive errors. <laughs> Though what, what that means is that there's all these ways that our minds do things automatically. They don't come to your mind to make a conscious choice about, right? And, and we need them. We can't be rethinking everything every, all day long, right? There's certain ways that these shortcuts uh, are very practical. Adam Grant, again, says, there are hundreds of cognitive biases, but most of them stem from a failure to recognize that our beliefs are subject to biases. Defending our views stalls learning. Questioning them stimulates growth. And I really want you to take this in. And I, this, I agree with this next statement. The only belief worth cherishing is the belief that you might be wrong. And there we back our, we're back around to humility and the importance of humility. To be able to think, oh, I was wrong. I might be wrong. What am I missing? And not feel shame or distress. More curiosity. I want to know. So um, these shortcuts, these things that we do, um, and if you want, I have some really good articles about this that go deeper. Um, just ask me. Um, so these are largely to reduce what's called cognitive load, strain, or stress. We, we are set up to save energy automatically. And if things are too taxing for our mental and emotional capacity, we'll make shortcuts. And Sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. 
and they create these biases and blind spots. Two of the ones I want to talk about, generalizing and stereotyping, are they're both shortcuts, right? You, I meet this man, I know he's an ex, and I, I know everything about him already, right? It's a shortcut. I've categorized you. Um, if I had a magic wand, in all these years I've been doing this work, if I had a magic wand and I could wish one thing for everybody, it would be stop generalizing. Every time you catch yourself saying, and I'm, I'm, I want to be careful, I'm not going to say anything too terrible, but if I were saying all women are something and all men are something, if I could just change the all to some, right? And what it does, first of all, it's, I, first of all, I think it's truer because not all of any group is any one thing, right? But it, it starts changing the way you perceive. You've got that in your, your closed system has opened to this other possibility. Also, if we're talking and trying to find some common ground, and I'm saying some of you instead of all of you even, it's a softening. It's like our nervous systems are able to like settle down, right? So um, that's one thing I'd love f um, everyone to be able to do more. And so remember the hidden tribes and perception gap studies where we, where they showed that there's a lot more nuance in these uh, statistics of people's extreme views and uh, where they are on the political spectrum. The other thing that gets in the way of, of viewpoint diversity is something called emotional reasoning. Basically is, I feel that it's true and right, and so it is true and right, right? And it often, nothing often will touch that. It's so strong. Now, there is some truth to, sometimes we have gut feelings or intuitions or these hunches that are right on, like almost like a sixth sense, right? But a lot of times there's other factors like bias, entrenched beliefs, self-righteousness that is, uh, it's cluttering our perception about what we're seeing, what's in front of us. Um, Adam Grant, again, he talks about the desired desirability bias. It's kind of like wishful thinking. It's actually just believing what you want to believe. And sometimes that emotional reasoning is in back of that. So um, I don't know. For me, it was really important to start parsing out uh, when something was more like an intuition to be relied on and when something else was running the show. One of the, one of the hints to me when it was my bias or something, it felt sticky. I don't know if you know like that, but when I started feeling like, oh yeah, that feels sticky instead of, hmm, I th the other thing, the intuition can feel a little more like clarity and, and not so much stickiness, but that's me. Um, the other thing that gets in the way is something called black and white thinking, which in psychological terms is called splitting. And I love this topic. Um, I think splitting is at the root of all this stuff. And I'm not going to go into deep depth about this right now, but it's the either or. It's the I'm right, you're wrong, we're right, you're wrong, you know, my side's right, your side's wrong, uh, good and bad, and all these kind of things. And when we're only seeing two options, um, we can be pretty sure we're not seeing the whole spectrum, right? Um, so that's a thing to pay attention to. The other thing that gets in the way is cognitive dissonance. How, how many of you heard that phrase before? Some. So it's the feeling you get when you come across information that challenges your sometimes long-held and cherished beliefs. They, they might have become sacred cows. These beliefs, they're untouchable, they're immutable to change. You could hear all kinds of things and you would never budge from that place. Um, so the feeling that you can get, it's different for different people. It can be bewilderment, disorientation, anger, rage, self-righteousness, pushback energy. My favorites used to be collapsing and crying. Crying was a really go-to place for me, but also anxiety and fogginess. It would, I would really get confused. I was unable to think through what was happening. So um, it's important to understand this may have happened to you in the past and, and you didn't know what, what was going on. That could be the reason. The first thing to do is identify that this is happening to you. The other thing I want to talk about are belief systems and narratives. 
So there, there's a philosopher named Robert Anton Wilson, and he said famously, the world is not governed by facts or logic, it is governed by BS, in parentheses, belief systems. <laughs> so what happens is our belief systems turn into narratives, and then we interpret everything, we tend to interpret everything that happens through the lens of these narratives. Some narratives feel more true to us because they better align with our worldview and previous experiences, while narratives that contradict our worldview feel less true even when they convey correct information. La 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 la. <laughs> and remember emotional reasoning. So um, what else do I want to say about this? Oh, John Haidt again said, every story gives you clues into certain facts. Sorry, every story clues you into certain facts, but blinds you to others, right? This, it creates this tunnel vision, and this is why we need to zoom out and be able to take in viewpoint diversity. So here's a little exercise for us to do. Um, you see our man here, he's framing. So I want you to take your, your fingers like that and look at anything. Just look at anything out. It could be the back of someone's head or something on the wall. Yeah, make a little frame. Okay, make a mental note of what you're seeing. And then go 90 or 180 degrees and see something else, right? And make a mental note of the second image. And if you're asked to make a narrative of either one, they may or may not connect. I mean, if you've got two, two bookshelves in the same view, you, you had some coherence. But, you know, you, I got the clock and I got the tree, right? There's no context. And the problem is, well, a funny example is when on lockdown on these Zoom business meetings, people would wear a tie and a button-down shirt, but pajama bottoms, and they'd have a, a, what do you call that, fake background where they're like in a library or something. We're not getting the whole picture. That's a funny one, but the not so funny one is in media with photo journalists and um, journalists themselves, and even in documentaries. What's, what's often a lot more interesting is what's on the cutting room floor. Because all, we all do, the, we're all biased. I'm not being, uh, this is not because they're evil. It's because they have a point they're trying to make. Like Robert Sapolsky said, we are easily manipulatable. I don't know how Faust he said, but within, it was less than a second, I think. We are easily manipulatable. Uh, manipulatable. Um, so um, that's another thing that really, really gets in the way of us understanding when we're framing or something's being framed for us. The last thing I want to talk about for this part is another danger of uh, getting in the way of viewpoint diversity. Contempt prior to, con to sorry, contempt prior to investigation. It's invalidating other points of view without even considering them. I won't ask how many of you have ever done this, but you know, it can sound like whatever someone from the other side, or it could be my spouse, it could be my, you know, it could be whoever you're having a dispute with. Whatever they say is ignorant, wrong, dangerous, stupid, fill in the blanks. But if we're doing that, we're not being open to what maybe someone knows something we don't plus about understanding the whole issue in and of itself beyond uh, opinions. So the last part of this is what can we do to temper some of these obstacles? I want to point out again that we're going against our biology, but we're also, as a part of that, going against our course of least resistance. Because when things are on autopilot, there they'll go. We don't have to do anything. But when, so that's the course of least resistance. But when we're trying to do things new, time for something new, um, it's, it's breaking with our habitual responses, our familiar sense of self, our tribalism, all of that. So what I have come up with is the art of the working hypothesis. So I'm not asking you to not have opinions. I'm asking you to not hold them so tightly. 
it would go something like this. Um, here are my conclusions about this issue up till now, as far as I know. If you could say I might be wrong if that feels genuine. And, but I'm poised to pivot if I receive new information that makes me think about things differently. It's not, this is my story and I'm sticking to it. This is, this is what I know right now because it is too hard to navigate the world with no positions, but it's how we hold them, I think, that makes the difference. Um, one thing that has helped is cultivate um, this attitude of being an anthropologist from Mars or Zen beginner's mind, things like that. How do we come? It's not that we don't know what we know in our experiences, but how do we hold them in a, in a certain way to expand our consciousness, actually? And to let in a fresh perspective with a more uncluttered heart, more uncluttered mind. Um, prepare to leave your comfort zone. We talked about this a minute. Um, and enter into your growth zone. And to really know that discomfort isn't always a bad thing. I'm not saying sometimes discomfort is get out of there, right? But again, it's discernment. When is it like, oh, there's growth at the other end of this. This is good for me to go through this discomfort. I'm going to learn something. Watch for cognitive dissonance. We talked about that. Uh, what I found really helpful, like I said before, is to make a map of my reaction to, you know, when I collapse and cry. And, and it started helping me identify when it was happening, calm myself, like this is okay, this is normal, this is what happens to humans. And I started to build some inner flexibility. That's what happened. Um, Nudging yourself towards nuance. That's a really favorite topic of mine, too. Instead of black and white thinking, either or thinking, I'm right, you're wrong. It's like, and I was telling somebody this before the class started. Um, I really I read people from the right or left, writers, thinkers, that I see will be critical of their own side and give credit to the other. Why? Because I know they're thinking. I know they're considering things and not just going by their ideological affiliation. So this kind of exercise, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, kind of, it kind of is limbering up for um, being a little more flexible in our thinking. We've talked about this already. Watch for contempt prior to investigation. Um, be mindful of confirmation bias and disconfirmation bias. Confirmation bias is also known as my side bias, which I think is a really helpful term. And uh, I don't think I mentioned this before. I want to talk about disconfirmation bias. Oh, I did. That, that's rejecting ideas that don't uh, correspond with what we believe. And funny enough, and studies have shown this, most of us can, can, call, can see in other people when confirmation or disconfirmation bias is running, but we can't see it in ourselves. That's another reason why we need you know, um, viewpoint diversity. We need people to help us see our blind spots. Um, another one is to learn to listen without forming a rebuttal. So that would be like, I can learn to sit tight and kind of listen till the person's done speaking, but I'm not really listening. I'm thinking, oh, that's nonsense, or he doesn't know what he's talking about, or yes, but. And so what am I doing? I'm waiting kind of patiently for my turn so I can tell him why he's wrong, right? Yeah. That's not, um, you can't listen and be in rebuttal mode at the same time, right? But these are all things that can be cultivated. And finally, this is the last slide, have int intellectual humility. Um, I might be wrong. I pulled this uh, last quote from a, a thinker named Salome Sibonex. She says, when you experience the difference of wanting to be right versus wanting to know it's true, it will overwhelm you to realize how often we choose the former, wanting to be right instead of wanting to know what's true. Thank you.